So I'm Tom, this is Charlie. Um, we've been working on JRuby a long time now. Um, but before we start, how many people have exposure to JRuby in some way? All right, yeah. most of you. Good, good. Like 83.5%. Um, so for those people who didn't raise their hand, I'm just gonna go over a quick overview quickly. Um, so JRuby is just another Ruby implementation. We try to be as compatible as we can with CRuby, and we actually support these three versions. Of course, uh, JRuby is built on top of the Java platform, so we get all the benefits uh, that Java has. We don't have to write our own garbage collectors. Um, Hotspot makes our code run very quickly, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, the most important thing here for people um, to notice is that Java has native threads, and so does JRuby. So there's no global interpreter lock. Uh, and there's a couple good talks later today. Uh, Jerry Antonio is going to talk about uh, how the GIL isn't your, your savior and how you can do a lot more with uh, real concurrent threads. Uh, that's at 115 in GM. Uh, and then Peter Halupa is going to talk about uh, the concurrent Ruby library and building a good, it's a good set of concurrency primitives and tools that work across all the different Ruby implementations. That's 420 in this room. So if you're interested in concurrency at all, those are two great talks to check out. Uh, I had to include this as one of my favorite, uh, favorite performance graphs for JRuby. So we've got, uh, we've got uh, a benchmark of a, a red-black tree library. The top is CRuby, MRI, running a pure Ruby red-black implementation, taking about two and a half seconds to run this benchmark. The benchmark creates a bunch of nodes, traverses them, deletes them, and does that over and over again. Uh, and you can see why we often have to, have to turn to C extensions on CRuby. So the second bar down is Ruby with C extensions. Certainly gets a lot of performance improvement, and this is you know, now taking only about 0.5 seconds. Uh, at the bottom, though, which is pretty cool, this is a very nicely well-written uh, pure Ruby red-black library. JRuby is able to optimize it. The JVM can do a lot. JRuby running the pure Ruby red-black tree actually performs faster than CRuby with the C extension here. And this is all because of the magic of the JVM, awesome garbage collectors, awesome optimizations. There's also a lot of Java libraries out there. Um, if there's something, if there's a Ruby gem that isn't cutting it for you, let's say you you're doing something with Prawn and you want to do something that Prawn can't do, you can just go over to the Java world and use iText. And compare this to, there's about 7,000 libraries on Ruby gems. So 7,000 libraries versus, versus 47,000 libraries that are in Maven. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there, just about anything you need, there's a JVM library for it. 47's greater than seven. <laughs> it's really easy to call into other languages. Java's highlighted. Oh, I think. Are you here? Yeah, okay. I think so. Um, Java's highlighted, and it's very easy to call Java with the Ruby syntax, but you can call any language that's on the Java platform, like Clojure. COBOL. COBOL, yeah. <laughs> um, so here's the two supported branches we have. Um, on masters, JRuby 9000, which we're going to be talking about, and then we still have a maintenance branch for JRuby 1.7. I'll probably continue maintaining 1.7 for maybe another six months or so, six months to a year. Maybe as, as long as people actually need 1.9 support, I think is, is going to be the answer. Um, JRuby 1.7 was a very interesting release for us because you can pick which compatibility level you want. You can either run in 1.8 or 1.9 mode with a, with a flag. Um, this ended up being a horrible idea for us because we have to maintain two runtimes in the same code base, and it just it didn't, didn't work out so well. So for JRuby 9000, we're only going to support the latest version of Ruby, and we're going to track the latest version of CRuby. So it's 2.2 right now. It will become 2.3. Right. Now that 2.3 now that preview 0, preview 1 is out, uh, we're going to start putting the features in. Hopefully within a month or two after MRI 2.3 is out, we'll have JRuby with 2.3 support right away. So uh, last Friday, before getting on the plane, 904 came out, and uh, next week when we get back, uh, 1723 will be out. We're very conference-driven here. So uh, JRuby 9000, these are like the super high-level bullet points. Uh, we already said how we're tracking CRuby. We have a brand new runtime. We've been working on this runtime for years. Um, most of this talk will be about this new runtime. Um, we're now bypassing Java for I.O. It's mostly just native calls. 
We can still fall back to Java, but this gives us better performance, and more importantly, it allows us to do some compatibility stuff that we couldn't do using the pure Java solution. Right, probably the most POSIX-friendly JVM language at this point. And uh, um, Onigurumas, um, transcoding facilities have been completely ported, and we have no more encoding bugs, I promise. <laughs> um, a few people might be wondering um, why we picked 9,000 as a version number. And it's, it's, to it's solely because of Dragon Ball, that's all. No. It's, it, started, it started as a joke because we were going to go and say JRuby 2, and then that, that was about the same time that Ruby 2 was coming out, and that would have been confusing as hell. So. We couldn't come up with a better number, and it just stuck. Charlie's even wearing the shirt today. That's right. It's over 9,000. So the funny thing is 9,000 started out as just kind of a code number for, for the release. Uh, but then we went back and looked, and we had eight previous major releases, 1.0 to 1.7. So it turned out that this is the ninth major release of JRuby. So 9.0, 9.0.0 is, is our version number. You can kind of say we're doing the Java numbering scheme, because they went from 1.4 to Java 5. Yeah. So. <laughs> So now what? Um, well, that's the, the title of the talk. And we do tons of compatibility work. We probably spend a lot more time in compatibility, but no one wants to hear about how we fixed compatibility bugs. So we're going to talk about performance. OK, so there's a few uh, recent things that we've done to improve performance for Ruby stuff. Stuff that we've wanted to do for years, but was really hard with the old runtime, make, made a lot easier by the new runtime work that we've got. Uh, we're going to go over these quick. Uh, there. So uh, the first one, uh, up through JRuby 1.7, when we would compile uh, JIT code to uh, JVM bytecode at runtime, we only did it on method boundaries. So if a method got called 50 times or more, then we would turn it into JVM bytecode and you'd get good performance out of it. Uh, now the problem is that there's a lot of code out there that just has freestanding procs or lambdas. Uh, so if you have a table of uh, procs that you're using for a bunch of calls, or if you're using define method, for example, those would never JIT, and so they'd stay in our interpreter and run slow, generally slower than MRI. Uh, so that was something we needed to fix. So in, uh, I think it was actually 903 that the, that the block jitting came out. I've got 904 on this graph. Uh, so here we, we show MRI. Uh, the blue bars here are the performance of a normal method, a, a, a regular def method. Uh, the other bar is define method, which uses a block and has some block overhead. Uh, and you can see that JRuby 901 here, uh, it, both cases were actually considerably slower than MRI because the benchmark had a bunch of blocks in it, and those didn't JIT. So not only were we not JITting the define methods here, which were really slow, we didn't actually JIT the benchmark. Now that we can JIT on block boundaries and on method boundaries, uh, the performance of both is much more where we'd want to see it definitely faster than MRI for regular method definitions, uh, and a, a little bit faster for, for define method. And that was the next thing that we wanted to tackle, was trying to get define method to perform a lot better than it does. It should be closer to a regular method. So here's a, an example of two different define methods. Uh, the first one we would consider simple because it's a non-capturing define method. It doesn't use any state from around the surrounding scope. It's just used for simple metaprogramming to create a, a method out of a block, basically. Uh, the second one here, we're iterating over some names, defining a method for each one. So the name actually is getting captured. It uses a bit of state from the surrounding scope. A little bit more complicated. So these are two, the two basic cases that we see for define method, and we wanted to be able to optimize these better. Uh, here's a comparison of the performance before the optimizations. You can see that in, uh, in CRuby and MRI, define method methods perform about half as well as uh, a regular method definition. And that's due to that extra closure overhead, extra state that needs to be managed, uh, and, and other various reasons. Uh, in JRuby, we were only slightly better than CRuby because we had the same sort of overhead to deal with, with defined methods. Um, so a little bit better performance on defined method, but not, certainly not as close to uh, a full-on method definition. Uh, so the strategy for optimizing these, uh, in the case of non-capturing defined methods, uh, we actually can just treat it as a plain method in our compiler. We do some inspection to make sure it doesn't access any surrounding state, uh, and then rather than compiling it as a block, we compile it as a method, and it should be close or exactly the same performance as a normal method. Uh, now, future work for this, if we see that we're doing some capturing, we've got some state in the outer scope, but we can tell that it's only being read within this defined method, we will also lift those values out as constant and then be able to optimize those cases as if they're regular methods too. 
Uh, so this is future work. We don't have this yet. Uh, so here's, here's the early results. This is what we had in uh, 903, 904 releases. Uh, over there on the far right is 904. You can see the method of a, the performance of a regular method definition. Uh, now the performance of a simple defined method with no captures is about twice what it was before. Uh, and actually it should be almost where regular methods are. There's probably some tuning and tweaking we need to do. So yes, all the defined methods out there within releases, within a few releases, we should be able to get them up to method level performance. Uh, so the other big one, uh, half the time when someone comes to us and says, JRuby is incredibly slow at this benchmark, and we don't know why, it's often because there's exceptions being raised all over the place. Uh, so backtrace cost and exception cost is, is high on CRuby. It's not free for sure. But on the JVM, it's way, way more expensive. Building a backtrace requires piecing together all sorts of inline frames, all sorts of other method structures, going back and forth between the Java interpreter and the compiled code. So it takes a lot longer than it does on CRuby. And as a result, this is a major pain for us. Uh, it's especially frustrating because exceptions are frequently ignored. They're just caught, and then you continue on with some other piece of code. Or they're used as flow control, uh, so used to unroll a stack back to some previous point. Uh, so what we wanted, we, fig we, rig we figured out how we could optimize this a little bit. If the exception is ignored or you don't ever look at it, you don't even use the backtrace, why don't we just not generate one? Uh, so here's the common pattern or the common anti-pattern that, that everyone loves to use. Uh, so if foo raises an exception here, uh, we can do our little quick postfix rescue and just return some simple value or make some other call, something simple like this. Uh, so if it's a standard error, it's going to fall in there. Uh, in this case, obviously, the exception is never going to be seen by anyone. There's no reason that we need to have access to it. So we can try and optimize this away. So the strategy here, we inspect the rescue block that goes with a, a chunk of code. Uh, if the contents of the rescue block is just a simple expression, like a local variable or a constant value or a nil or something, uh, we set a thread local flag that says we don't need a backtrace for any exception that might be raised down stack. Uh, then when we get to the point of raising the exception, building the stack trace, we check this flag and we can omit all of that work from, gen from generating the backtrace. And so for cases like this, uh, this, you know, this is a contrived case. We hate when people use rescue nil, but we do understand how, help, how uh, useful it is. Uh, but there's also other simpler cases that are actually practical uses of this. So these are some of the value converters in csv.rb. Uh, if you turn on converters, it will basically run each of them in turn. And if they raise an exception, it just returns the old value and proceeds to the next converter. Uh, Psych had some code like this for a while too, where it would just let the, tr the conversion fail so that it knew to try the next conversion in the chain. So uh, MRI could add this pretty easily. MRI could make this change and it would be great for them too. Uh, so this is obviously horrible for us. If you had a, a value that didn't convert until the last converter or maybe didn't convert with any of the converters at all, we'd be throwing maybe four, maybe five exceptions, building entire stack traces for them and then throwing them away. And so our performance on CSV was terrible as a result of this. Uh, but the good news is, this is the improvement that we have. Uh, so this, this is uh, based on uh, just doing a simple rescue, just measuring the rescue itself. CSV.RB itself was something like five times faster for the performance. And with the work that we did, raising a simple exception, and oh, you want, you want this one? There you go. And now, and now, now on a logarithmic scale, so you can actually see it. Uh, so nearly two orders of magnitude faster for this pattern on JRuby, uh, and this is in 904. This works great. Now, I, I do need to mention that there are cases where we can't make this optimization. So the typical uh, non-blocking read case, which throws an E again, uh, because we're doing a select call here, we can't necessarily see through that. We don't know if the exception is going to be used. Uh, we do have some strategies we want to put in place, like if we can see that it's an internal method that doesn't use the exception, we might still be able to set the flag. Uh, but for cases like this, currently we don't generate a backtrace for E again because it's not really an exceptional case. It's an expected uh, result of this call. Uh, and in, in Ruby 2.1 and higher, uh, you can actually pass a flag here that says don't raise the exception, just return a nil. Uh, and then if you get a nil value from this, it means that the non-blocking read didn't work. So obviously both JRuby and MRI are trying to work around the cost of exceptions and make it easier to work with them without having performance hits. All right, on to Tom. So um, I said we had a new runtime. It's called IR for internal representation. 
probably the most boring name for a runtime ever. Um, from JRuby 1.7 and earlier, um, we did everything with the abstract syntax tree. So we'd go and parse your Ruby into a tree, and the interpreter would just kind of bounce around in the syntax tree. The JIT would just kind of bounce around in the syntax tree and generate bytecode. We wanted to get away from that. We wanted to work with Ruby semantics directly. Um, we wanted it to have a traditional compiler design. We wanted anyone who's taken a compiler's course or read the Dragon book to be able to look at our code and be able to contribute to it. And no one ever wants to write an another piece of software again, so this is our last runtime. <laughs> yes, fingers crossed. <laughs> so, so this is, and the top dash line, this is what 1.7 looks like today. You know, we lex and parse and we create that syntax tree. But now we have these extra phases in 9000. We have semantic analysis where we actually translate that tree into a set of instructions. Um, we create some other supplementary uh, data structures like a control flow graph. After that, we go into an optimization phase and we run a series of uh, um, compiler passes, which then go and modify those data structures. Then we interpret those machines, um, virtual machine instructions, and after they've been running for a while, then we decide we're gonna go and uh, um, generate Java bytecode, and then Hotspot goes crazy on it and makes it fast. Um, we don't actually support Dalvik generation, but. But we can. I, I refuse to remove it until we support it. <laughs> Um, so here's our first look at instructions. I cleaned this up because the actual output of IR is, is not for the faint of heart. Um, so we'll just look at a couple of the instructions. At, at the top, we have check arity. We have to make sure that there's two required arguments. Um, lines one and two, we're binding the parameters A and B to the zeroth and first value passed in. Um, on line three, we have special variables for like, um, for the receiving like blocks. Block, yeah. yeah. Um, if a block is passed in. We look at line five, we have a line number instruction. If we happen to raise, that's how we know what line the error occurred in the Ruby source. Let's see, uh, line eight, uh, we're calling the plus method on the receiver A with the argument C, A plus C. Um, it's pretty simple to read. Um, also in semantic analysis, we do a lot of transformations. Um, this one I really like. Um, we, uh, Everyone knows what Z super is, right? If you don't put the parentheses, then it passes all the parameters. Right, the magic super that just passes everything that you re received. I always just think this is so crazy. But um, now, now in IR, we, we just do a simple transformation. We convert it to a regular super, whereas in 1.7 and earlier, we, we had to maintain this extra state and then look it up when we, when we ran into Z super in the syntax tree. So we ended up uh, dramatically simplifying how we handle this. In fact, there's no special code now other than doing this one small change when we first build our instructions. Uh, we have uh, pluggable compiler passes. Um, dead code elimination and constant propagation are, are two of the popular ones. So I'll just go through an example of those quick. Um, so we're gonna go back to the same snippet of code. Um, the first thing we can see is that B isn't used. And then that special block variable, we're not doing anything with blocks. Boom, it's gone. Um, the next thing that we notice is that C is only used once. So we can. And has a constant uh, value. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing I refuse to fix on the slides. <laughs> That's when I first learned how to use actions. <laughs> um, but C is no longer needed either. And then. Finally, nothing can happen between these two line number instructions, so we can get rid of that as well. So we are able to get rid of half the instructions. And this is just static analysis. I mean, we're going to get into some cool stuff later, but we can do a lot of cleanup in the code uh, just by having some intelligent compiler passes. That's right. And so everything we do is done with static analysis today, and it's conservative. Um, no optimization we do can fail or have to de-optimize. So the big thing that we're working on right now is getting method inlining working. Um, all optimizing runtimes uh, get most of their performance from inlining methods. Um, and it's great because uh, we get to eliminate a whole bunch of data that we um, have to store. We don't have to create a stack frame. We don't have to pass parameters to it and get the return value back. And in JRuby, it's extra important because we're building stuff on top of Java. So we have to pass extra stuff that Java doesn't have to pass, so we have to allocate a whole another structure and pass those values in. Once we inline the method back, um, none of that stuff is there anymore. 
Um, I'm using Ruby code here and not showing you IR again because it wouldn't fit on the screen. Um, we have a Ruby snippet on the left, which is my sample program, and on the right is what it would look like as equivalent Ruby code after the inline happened. So um, we just count down from a million, and we're calling this decrement one, so we're calling this method a lot. Let's inline it. So the first thing we do is we, we add a guard. We need to make sure that the type uh, hasn't changed, because if the type's changed, perhaps there's a new version of decrement one. Um, but so long as that guard passes, then we just call the inline body here, I minus one. However, if the guard ever fails, then we just go back to doing method dispatch. So um, this is incredibly simple, um, and that's why we started with this. And it never deops, which is really good because we can't deopt yet. But it's also bad because we can't deopt yet, um, or we want to deopt. And it's not virtuous. Now, I don't think this is really a thing, but I put it in here anyways. I believe when you run compiler passes, every time you get done with a compiler pass, hopefully you've provided more information so that you have more options for compiler passes to continue using that new information and continuing to create this virtuous cycle. So if we go back and look at this post inline method, and now we're deciding we want to do another optimization, well, the first thing that we'd look at is like, What's the type of i? If we can figure out that i is a fixed num, we can do some math specialization. But um, unfortunately, um, with this inliner, we still have this fail case. And so this fail case is for when decrement one gets changed to be a different method. So we have no idea what i is. So this sucks. Um, but what we want to move to next for our next inliner, it's going to look more like this. You'll notice that the uh, um, while body is a lot smaller now. Um, we still have the inline body. But instead of guard same with a question mark, we have guard same with an exclamation point. And what this means is that we'll go and raise an exception. And that exception will be, it's time to deoptimize. We'll save at what point in state we are in this version of the method and any um, variables that in their current state, and then we'll go back to a safe version of the method and go in at the same semantic point and start executing on the safe one. Right, so we can basically, if something changes with our expectations in our optimized code, we can back off. Uh, probably the most important way, the important, uh, the important optimization is de-optimization, being able to back off from a, an over-optimized version. Yeah. Um, but uh, the nice thing with this version is now we can with 100% uh, certainty know that this is uh, a fixed num. And I, I did cheat here because minus can be overridden, but let's, let's pretend that it can't. <laughs> um, and so from this virtual, virtuous cycle perspective, deoptimization is a good idea, but um, let's ask ourselves a question. If at any point I can deoptimize and go back to a safe version of a method, why not just do super crazy optimizations and hope they work out? Because the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to have to de-optimize back to the slower version. So the only cost of actually trying to do aggressive optimizations is that it'll take longer to get to steady state performance. And, and how, do, how do you make aggressive decisions? Ooh. Ooh. It's, 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 not, it's not that exciting, though. Um, we just collect information. So um, there's two things that we are um, collecting in our profiler. Um, how hot something is, so if you, if you spin through a loop a whole bunch of times, then anything in that loop is probably a good candidate for some sort of optimization. If, if uh, the objects in that loop uh, um, don't change types, um, maybe that's a candidate for inlining a method. Or if it's a fixed num, maybe it's a, a candidate for uh, some numeric specialization. So numeric specialization is the next big thing that we want to work on after we have inlining really solid. Uh, so in Ruby, everything's an object, sort of. Uh, numbers in C Ruby are generally represented as uh, what's called a tagged pointer. So there's no objects allocated. It's just a 64-bit wide value that has some bits set so that they know that it's not a pointer. You can pass it around as though it were a pointer to an object, but then every once in a while you check and see if those bits are there. You know it's a number. Uh, so now on the JVM, we don't have tagged pointers. We have references, which are object types. 
and we have primitives. Uh, and they're not incompatible in the bytecode. You can't pass a primitive for an object or an object for a primitive without boxing or unboxing either way. Uh, and what we really want to do is to be able to optimize numerics and, and numeric algorithms using the primitive values so that we're not creating objects all the time. Uh, so fixNum, for example, uh, as I mentioned, in, in MRI, it's a 64-bit value. A couple of those bits are used to tag it. So it can only really represent 62 bits of fixNum values without going to a big num object. Uh, in JRuby, we have to use an object all the time. So to reduce the cost of the most commonly used fixNums, we cache minus 256 to 255. So essentially, uh, signed and unsigned byte range will not generally allocate a new fixNum in JRuby. And that helps pretty well. We've tried to bump this range up and create a larger range of cache values, but massively diminishing returns outside of this range. Uh, and the JVM has its own primitive value for uh, an integer type or a fixed num sort of type, a 64-bit signed long. Uh, that's what we'd like to be able to use, and we want to try and use long whenever there's a fixed num as much as possible for performance. So if we look at a simple example here that's just running a, a, a loop, a numeric loop, um, we got this number coming in. It's probably going to be a fixed num. It looks like it's being used as a fixed num. This is something that profiling can tell us. Or if the inline, if this looper code was inline somewhere else, and we could see that n was actually a fixed num value, then we'd have that type available. Um, I here obviously is a fixed num because we've got a constant value for it, and like I mentioned, that's going to be a cached object. So at least for small value, for, for literal fixed num values, we won't be creating an object every time. Uh, but then it gets a little tricky. So do something is doing a call and passing i along. Well, we've determined that it's probably going to be a fixed num all the time, but we don't know if that target method is ready for a fixed num or if it's made for an arbitrary type. So we have to figure out what that type needs to be. Uh, and then we're incrementing i every time, and this will generally create a new fixed num object for every loop. Uh, and that's something we want to get rid of. So the idea is that with some profiling magic and with our de-optimization tricks so we can back off, we should be able to turn our looper method into the long version here, the primitive version, so that it will optimize as well as possible. Uh, ideally, that'll pass through to do something. We'll be able to specialize that for longs, get better performance. And because we have our de-optimization, if, if it ever turns out we made the wrong decision about this, we can just back off, jump back into the interpreter, and use regular fixed num objects until you know, we do a little bit more profiling and figure things out. Uh, so this will be great. Uh, we've done some early experiments with this uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, our compiler guy did a, a prototype of an unboxing pass for the compiler. Uh, and the performance of, for example, a Mandelbro or other numeric algorithms is 10 to 20 times faster than running regular JRuby. So this will be coming along probably in the next few months. And that, but that was without guards in place. So that was without some guards in place. But you know, once we get our de-optimization, we should be able to do pretty well. Yeah. Um, so today, uh, we do actually have a profiler, and uh, it's a little rusty. A lot of this stuff was written years ago as experiments, and it's just such an exciting time to be a JRuby engineer. Um, so uh, that's going to be the, the next, in the next couple weeks, we're going to make that work again. Uh, the inliner now is working again. Um, we got dusted off. It, you can inline a method and a simple closure at the same time. Some really, really impressive uh, um, results. But unfortunately, um, I only got it working in the interpreter, so they're pretty meaningless. To say that something's running 30% faster in the interpreter is going to have totally different performance characteristics once it jits. And we're not going to actually inline for the interpreter. So uh, we only have our de-optimization strategy in emails. and. It's, it's a lot more complicated than we thought it would be, um, but we are getting close to having something that we think we want to code up now. We, we pretty much have all of the, we, we know how to do it. It's just a matter of getting the IR to be able to back off properly. Yeah. And uh, there's lots and lots of bugs, even in the inliner, even though it works. I noticed uh, when I inlined a method and a closure back, I noticed that there were like three return instructions all in a row. <laughs> I mean, the first one, works, so the program works, but where did these extra return instructions come from? So we have some cleanup to do. But as I said, this is super, super exciting. We've been waiting years for, for this. Yeah, we're, and I forgot to mention, JRuby 9000, we spent more time on compatibility than probably any release. Everybody that we've heard that's made the transition from 1.7 to, to 9000 has had a great experience with it. Um, we really are pretty much 
compatible with 2.2. Everything pretty much works, which has freed us up to start looking at some of these crazier optimizations now. So it is really exciting time. Refinements. Refinements are they work. They yeah, sort of work. They sort of work. It's hit that 80% who, sweet spot. Who's using refinements here? Yeah, you guys get out. <laughs> 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 no, it, it, it works for simple cases. We, we're waiting to see what people report for bugs. So we're kind of pragmatic on that. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the, the status of JRuby today, the stuff we're working on for tomorrow. Um, we really should talk a little bit about what the JVM folks are also doing with us, working in concert with us. Uh, so we used to work at Sun Microsystems. We're good buddies with the OpenJDK folks, the Hotspot team, the GC guys. Uh, and they use JRuby as one of their primary test cases for making JVM improvements and making improvements to Invoke Dynamic and making improvements to garbage collection. So they're talking to us all the time. Uh, so there's a couple, two projects I wanted to talk about that are upcoming for Java 9 and, and beyond. So the first one, uh, we all love FFI. It's, it's let us have real native POSIX I.O., real POSIX uh, process control. Uh, but we do it all as a separate library. We want something at the JVM level. Uh, and so I proposed a, a JEP, this is JDK enhancement proposal, JEP 191 is Project Panama, which is like, you know, bridging north and south, Java and native. Uh, so this will be native support at the JVM level for doing FFI. And now what's cool about this, they already have code generators that you can just feed it a header file and it'll generate all of the JVM code that you want for that binding. Uh, but the JIT also knows about this. So when you compile code that's making a native call and it's and compile your Java code that makes a native call, it'll actually just go and do the C call for you in the JITted code. There's no extra layers to bounce through, no, no function pointers and indirection. So it's going to be basically as fast as if you wrote it in C to begin with. So here's, the, here's the, uh, the old way that we always had to do. Uh, if you wanted to call into some C library from the JVM, you'd have to write a, a little JNI stub on both sides, a little bit of Java code, a little bit of C code, and that sucks, because then you've got to compile that in every platform, or you've got to ship binaries for every platform. Uh, so we've ended up using a, a library called JNR. Uh, JNR is Java native runtime. It's basically our JVM FFI uh, that we've built over years for the, for the JRuby project. And so all we have to write now is just the JNR stub. It programmatically will go and figure out where the library is, find the right function pointers, and then bind it to our callable. Yeah, but we, we traded off having to write C every time for writing Java. Right, so we're still writing Java every time. And there's, there's enough layers here that the JVM can't really see through this. Uh, it's certainly not any faster than doing a JNI call, which is not fast to begin with, uh, but we've got some extra layers of indirection. So the goal with Panama, and as I understand, they have this working now in early builds of, of Java 9, uh, what we would do is just tell Panama the C library that we want to call or generate it using some of their tooling, uh, and the JIT will then know about both sides. It'll be able to actually optimize this all the way through, and so we'll see something like this. When the, the, C, the, the Ruby code JITs at the JVM level, if you're doing a get PID call through Panama, it'll actually be a get PID call right into libsystem or into libc. That's awesome. Uh, this is actually working now in some of those early builds. So the other thing, uh, what's the biggest problem with JRuby? Startup time, by far. Uh, if, we had solved, if we could solve the startup time problem, I, I think we'd be done. Like, everybody would just use JRuby all the time for everything. Uh, so this is our greatest challenge for sure. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Everything starts out cold. Uh, our parser starts out interpreted at, by the JVM. Uh, our IR compiler, all of our core classes. So basically, we are in, we're in the early stages of executing Ruby code, we're running an interpreter, our IR interpreter, on top of another interpreter, the JVM interpreter. Now, eventually that stuff warms up and we end up performing significantly better than MRI, but those first few seconds, everything is cold, 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 all the way through. Uh, now, we're also starting to use more and more Ruby code in JRuby to implement Ruby functionality, and that, that ends up just aggravating the problem. So now, even to get JRuby started, we have to parse a lot of Ruby code, interpret a lot of Ruby code, uh, and make things worse over time. Uh, so here is how bad it actually is. Uh, so this is uh, three different uh, actions you might want to do in Ruby. So dash E with dash E1, just a simple uh, startup of the JRuby run, or the Ruby runtime. Uh, a gem list with probably about 100 gems uh, installed, and rake minus T in a Rails app. So that will boot up Rails and then get a list of all the tasks that are available. Uh, and, you know, obviously, orders of magnitude slower here, at least an order of magnitude slower than C Ruby for all of these things. Uh, so the one thing that we can do right now is set a flag to optimize this a bit. 
So uh, starting a little over a year ago, JRuby 1.7.10 or something like that, we added a dash dash dev flag that you can pass to JRuby. Uh, and what this will do is it'll turn off our JIT, which takes some overhead and, and slows some things down at the beginning. Uh, it sets the JVM to a, a lower optimizing mode. So it's not spending as much time thinking about the code. It's getting the code up and running in a simpler form right away. Uh, and this actually helps a great deal. So for most cases, this is at least a 50% reduction in startup time. Uh, if you're not using dash dash dev on JRuby, give it a try. It'll, it'll, it really helps improve performance. Definitely the first line of defense for, for making it look a little bit better. Uh, so the thing that the JVM folks are working with us on, uh, they're working on their own ahead of time compiler for Java code. Uh, and this is ahead of time comp comp compilation of Java to native code. Uh, so they'll, they, what they'll be able to do is they'll take the hot code that runs in JRuby at startup, like our parser and our compiler and interpreter and so on, uh, and give us a pre-compiled native version of that. That should get us significantly closer to a, a real native runtime as far as booting. Uh, and now the really cool stuff thing here is that they don't just stop at that point. They give us the native code, but it still has all of the information for the JVM to continue optimizing it. So unlike our dash dash dev flag, we'll get fast startup and it will continue to optimize at the JVM level and get full peak performance. Uh, and so it's, it's getting there. So here is uh, just the rake minus T. There's JRuby with no flag, uh, then JRuby dash dash dev down from it. Uh, and then two versions of the, A the, the AOT work that the, the, or the Oracle folks are working on. Uh, the bottom one is that optimizing AOT, where it can get the fast startup performance and then still continue on to peak performance and run as fast as, as it would if, without flags turning it off. And this is really early work. Uh, we know that there's a lot of stuff, and so this is supposed to be part of Java 9. Even if it's not, we've already heard from the Oracle folks that they're gonna let us use it. So eventually you will be able to use AOT stuff with a JRuby runtime. Uh, there's many, many tweaks that we can do to make the AOT work better for the, for the Oracle guys. Uh, they've told us about little bits and pieces that don't optimize well, changes that we can make to the code. We're gonna keep iterating on this and drop that bar even further. Uh, so the ideal is that all the code that runs at boot for JRuby should run native, uh, and it should get us significantly closer to MRI performance on startup. And we won't necessarily lose all the optimizations that are cool in the JVM. Uh, so closing it out, um, last year we asked companies to, to let us know if they're using JRuby so we could put their logos on a slide, and this is just a day's worth of gathering tweets from people. A uh, really amazing response. M most of these we had no idea that they were running JRuby. Uh, so this stuff is really important for the Ruby world. There's a ton of people out there running it for very important things. One of my favorites here is uh, BBC News. All of the election results that they report are a JRuby application. Uh, using a bunch of cool concurrency tricks, they've got some little Sinatra apps, but they've had no problems with load, it works great. Uh, they definitely couldn't have done it if it was just MRI alone. Uh, so it's exciting stuff here, and uh, we're really happy to have you folks here that are interested in JRuby, and folks like this that are actually putting it into production. Oh, uh, I don't think we have uh, a slide on this, but um, we're having hacking and office hours from two to four today. Right, so if anybody's interested in sitting down with us with an application or a bug you have or performance that doesn't look like it's where it should be, uh, we're gonna be in the, uh, the boff room. I think we're in section A, you'll see us, uh, from two to four today. So stop on by and we can chat a little bit. Uh, and before I forget, I've, I've got a whole bunch of JRuby stickers, so if anybody wants it, this is JRuby, like J-A-Y Ruby, the Ruby J, he's our little mascot. Uh, so if you want a JRuby sticker, come up and grab one, or, or come to uh, the hacking session at 2 to 4. And that's all we have. Thank you. Right. So uh, the question is about the status of Invoke Dynamic. So Invoke Dynamic is a, a JVM feature added in Java 7 that lets us bind dynamic calls like in Ruby more, much more directly so that the JVM sees them as though they're regular Java calls and can optimize in line, do all that cool stuff. Uh, it works great performance-wise. So if you're, if you're running with it in a production application, performance will be better in almost all cases. Uh, let us know if it's not. And it, it works, it's uh, solid as far as uh, bugginess, is like all, they've worked out all the issues. Definitely give it a shot for straight line performance. Uh, I will say that they've improved things, but at the moment it, it does have a startup impact. So it's not something I'd recommend that you run as part of your standard command line when you're executing stuff. Uh, but if you want peak performance, it's definitely the way to go. And there's a flag for that, dash x, invoke, compile dot invoke dynamic equals true, something like that. So you can turn it on and then get the performance you want. 
Yeah, so the problem is that there's, there's like no RVM master anymore. So the question was about uh, RVM is still kind of stuck on like an old JRuby version, uh, at least for the release RVM. So if you try to go install JRuby 9000, it installs a preview release from many months ago. Uh, so my recommendation, until somebody in the RVM world can get a release out, uh, just use the head version of RVM, RVM get head to update. That one has all the fixes in place so that it will actually know the right, most current version of JRuby to install. <laughs> Why 50 iterations before JIT? Good question. Uh, it's kind of an arbitrary number. Um, it, so, so the JVM has its own like simple optimizer. Their count is about 100, I think, for C1, uh, this, the, the lighter weight compiler. Uh, we just kind of programmatically figured out that you know, typically 50 is a good number for telling whether a piece of code is hot. Uh, with, the, with the now blocks jitting, that actually helps considerably because if you call a method once and do a heavy loop with a block in it, now we will also compile the block. So, 50 is not a bad number. It keeps too much from compiling, but the hot stuff usually gets picked up. But this is something that might change once we uh, get the profiler in. Right. Then, then we'll be able to make a much smarter decision about what's hot. Yeah, so the profiler would be able to see, OK, this method's only been called twice, but it, it does a lot of work. Maybe we should actually go ahead and compile this. They're probably going to keep using it. It's really, like it's really funny to see the initial request spikes on a Rails app. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's spikes at 50 requests and spikes at 100 requests. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as more and more stuff slowly starts to get compiled. It, it doesn't look quite as bad because uh, we do uh, um, compilation off thread now. So right, it, right. It's not It, it kind of trickles in a little bit, but it used to just be like, eh, eh. <laughs> It's going to be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it, it's probably going to be a lot lighter weight in many cases because, uh, so the question, yes, thank you. So the question was, uh, what is the likely uh, memory impact of inlining uh, as far as the overall size of the runtime? Um, so the IR is gonna be a lot bigger, but if we can compile one inlined version of a method with all of its calls, uh, that should be less JVM bytecode, that should be less native code generated, rather than having all of the separate methods compile on their own. Um, the other aspect of this is that if we're able to inline a method with a block and the block and all of that comes back, back to the beginning, well, we're not going to have to create any block structures for it. We're not going to have to push all that state around. That's stuff that we're not going to have to worry about. It's going to really improve performance of those. Like those. Live runtime state might get reduced, but IR memory is going to be, I think, a big issue. Um, we're, we're using like 30% more memory now than we were in 1.7, so we're, we're going to get that down. That will we'll level out. but. If we have to have multiple copies of methods, then we're going to have n times as much memory, right? right. So. And again, this is something that you may not necessarily run on a local development environment, but you know, throw it into testing and production, then you get the performance you want. Yeah, I, I guess the other thing, too, is once the profiler is going, I think we're going to be um, jitting a lot less stuff. Um, right, we'll be able to make smarter decisions about what to compile and when to compile it. So that'll help balance it out a little bit, too. Uh, yeah, that's that's like the weird thing, though, when, when you start working on these projects and try to figure out how to make things fast, you just assume, ah, oh, I can just keep inlining forever and I can make it, like, super fast, but there's all these trade-offs you have to do to, like, actually still have it, like, not use tons of memory or take 10 hours to warm up, <laughs> you know? All right, I think that's it for us. Thanks for coming out. Hopefully we'll see you at 2 to 4.